Today, my, some of my former students in arts-based research are going to present their uh, cultural arts-based work that they learned in their countries. We have Michelle from Brazil, we have Chen from China, and we have Alyssa who's doing tap dancing from the United States. And this all came about because in the ABRA class, I tried very hard to help my students understand that they needed to know their epistemology, their positionality with respect to qualitative research. What helped them decide what they were going to study, how they were going to study it, what a priori questions would guide their research, what theoretical frameworks they would use, what data they would collect, how they would analyze, code the data and then analyze it, and how might they come to discoveries, conclusions, and implications. They are the researchers, because it's qualitative research, they are the researchers who do this work. Qualitative researchers don't depend upon any sort of statistical analysis. Qualitative researchers are the ones who do it all. And so they have to know themselves because whoever they are influences what they do as qualitative researchers. So I thought for quite a while and I thought, oh, I have to do something because I tried a timeline and that didn't work so well. And I thought maybe I can get my students to think about uh, their lives when they were younger or when they lived in other contexts beside the United States. And they learned a particular art form. And there were many people in the class who uh, could relate to that. In particular, these three ladies, young ladies, certainly re related to it. And that's why they are bringing this to you today. They learned who they are currently as a qualitative researcher. And we always continue to grow as qualitative researchers and move forward and become what we were not prior to that. So I turn it over to my students. Thank you. In this presentation, I will share my journey of finding my epistemology through music. I will explain the conflict I met between Eastern and Western culture and how I finally find my way to understand myself and guide my research. The music I play is named Qin Sang Chu.
Music contains text, sound, and performance, and is intrinsically social in ways that extend beyond its status as a socially constructed art form. Based on research, Western culture is considered as a virtual culture, provides strong virtual stimulation. However, Eastern culture, which is the one I grew up with, focuses on poetic inquiry and music inquiry. So those are really big differences between the Eastern and Western. And another big difference is how we express ourselves, like our emotions, our feelings, in Eastern culture and Western culture. Talking about the music I played, it's named Qing Sang Chu. If I translate it directly, Qing Sang means a kind of tree. So the title of this music is the music piece for a tree. So you will never guess or understand what's the content of this music. This really represents the Eastern way of express our feelings. So basically, this music talks about the story of a lady who just got married, but her husband was forced to join the army and stayed far away from home. So when spring came, the husband is still not getting back home. So the lady was missing him so much, and she wants to get. Information like any information notes from the army or from the people who getting back from the army. As I said, in Eastern culture, we are not supposed to express our feelings openly. So everything the lady see in front of her, like all the beautiful views, seems not that beautiful. Seems like a, there's a shadow there. Because she missed her husband so much, everything is so sad for her. When I play the music, you will find there's sound very high, very low, and at the later part, it's very fast. The later part is because there's someone getting back from the army, and the lady was eager to get to that guy and to ask if he has some information about her husband, but. No, no one knows where he is. And for the first part, like very slow, um, like the feeling of worrying is because the lady was worried about her husband. As I said, in East Eastern culture, we're not allowed to express our feelings and emotion openly, especially in front of other people. Example is how we express love. Like in my life, I never heard my parents said I love you to each other. Like you know, you can feel that. So that's typical Eastern culture. So I was used to、uh, hold my feelings, like hide my feelings. When I get to America, I notice the Western culture. Everything you want to say, you just say it loud. If you are not happy, you are okay to say that. If you like something, you like, I like it. I was shocked at first, and then I realized how can I get used to that. Uh, I'm not very comfortable about the things happening around me in U.S. Like the way people express their feelings and emotions. So when I get to my research, I realize that I was trained in Western culture in the way openly express yourself, openly share your ideas and emotions. All the things back inside me ask me to. Hide all my feelings and like hide my opinions. Not,、uh, not openly share my opinions and thoughts. So there's a battle inside me. So I always have like a dilemma on this whether I want I should say that loud or I should hide my opinions. But when I get to back to my music, I realize all the poetic inquiries, all the meanings. That I have in my Chinese music can help me understand better about the Western cultures now I'm in. Because music as a method may allow researchers to get at a express of a multiplicity of meanings or layered meanings not communicable in other forms. So I played and performed Gu Jin. A traditional Chinese music for more than twenty years. The traditions of Chinese music deeply 
influence my heart. The way I play louder, quiet, faster, or slower all changes the rhythm. It reflects the emotion and the spherical changes that make my audience feel. They can feel how strong or weak. Like the feel, the sound, the strong sounds of the music and the weak sounds of the music. Also, they can feel my feelings as a performer. To me, it's equally to the way in Western culture people say something. I just use another form to share my opinions there, to share my emotions there. Like music really helped me to identify that. As I, the more I played, and the more I trained in Western culture as a good researcher in qualitative research, I realized that I can actually find a balance. There's a balance point between the Western and the Eastern part of me inside my heart, and I realized that the way. The music was built. Whether it's a Western culture and Eastern culture, built piece by piece, it can help people share their feelings and emotions by the beautiful sound that you you have. So every piece has its meanings. Every movement has its meanings, which is really making me found my、um, epistemology and as a constructivist. So every piece I have, every experience I have in Western culture, and every history I have grew up in the Chinese culture, the Eastern culture, help me identify the way I'm learning and the way I search and view different things. Now I view myself as a researcher. Like I can combine both Eastern culture and Western culture. I know. When I should share openly about my opinions, before this presentation, I never thought like music is the way for me to do research because I'm from um technology department. My department, I didn't see any of my professor or professors I met in conference did anything about art. Ah,、uh, we're more focusing on statistics and technology website things like that. I never thought the art part of me can be so influential to my life as a researcher. Help me understand myself more. I really appreciate this great opportunity, and I hope the art can making people as a way to find yourself. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Alyssa Battistini, and I am starting my second year in the curriculum and instruction elementary education program. Uh, at USF, and I began my arts-based research journey about a year ago. I took Dr. Janet Richards' arts-based research class, and it was suggested to me because I'm very interested in understanding how arts can influence、um, curriculum, education, and ourselves.、Um, and so, one of the questions that Dr. Richards asked at the beginning of the semester was. What is your epistemology? And to be quite honest with you, I had no idea what the word even meant.、Um, I had only taken one course, and I was just learning, so I didn't really know、um, what epistemology was and how important it was in my research. And so we started this reflective process, and I started journaling each day. After、uh, teaching math, I'm a full-time math teacher as well, and I noticed that my journal entries were very negative. I was not finding topics that I wanted to look further into、um, to do my project for the Aber class.、Um, I I really did not want to focus on、uh, what was happening in my classroom because I was feeling inadequate. Um, I had been teaching dance for three years at a charter school, and I had just come back to the regular classroom, and I was really grappling with having to teach an FSA taught subject,、um, really just getting back into the routine of being a teacher, and also handling my PhD program. So every day I would sit down to journal, and everything came out negative, and. 
then I would improvise. I improvise as a tap dancer uh, about 30 minutes every day. And I take that time for myself to kind of get rid of all of the thoughts in my mind and just, um, it's just me and the wood. So it's really important to me as a professional tap dancer to make sure that I'm in my shoes every single day. And so I decided to switch the schedule. I started improvising before I would journal. And I also started to mull over this question that Dr. Richard has, Dr. Richards had asked, what is your epistemology? And I thought about my students, I thought about myself, I thought about my research that I wanted to know more about. Um, and I realized that I am a tap dancer and tap dance is so important in my life that I really have to try to integrate it into my research. So each day I would improvise and then I would journal and I noticed that my journals became much more positive over time. And it was an amazing feeling to know that this small time frame of improvisation can help me to refocus and really think about the things that are important to me. I've been a tap dancer for many years. Um, I'm a professional tap dancer. I manage a youth company that brings uh, youth from around the country um, in conjunction with a group called the Syncopated Ladies out of LA under the direction of Chloe Arnold. And she invited me to come on as company manager and staging director so that when we put out performances, I will travel to the event and I stage the number. And last fall, I was given the opportunity to stage a number at Radio City Music Hall. And that was while I was taking my ABRA class. And I really started to think about tap dance as a historical event in my life. Tap dancing derives from African slavery here in the United States. It started when the African slaves had their drums taken away because they were sending messages of freedom to each other. And so they had to find a way to send the messages and they would beat these rhythms. Um, and so they started using their feet. And over time, as um, slaves escaped or were freed, the slave owners thought more and more about how were these uh, people communicating. And then, um, so tap dancing sort of just took off from there. And even though it was a way to send messages in the beginning, over time, it became an important part of the African American culture that those slaves, well, really the African culture that the slaves were trying to keep together, that normally they would have drums, they would use their feet uh, when they were celebrating. And so over time, it became an African-American art form. Um, and you can see even in old movies and um, what that style of tap dancing really looks like. If you were to watch like Bill Bojangles Robinson, um, most famously known for dancing with someone like Shirley Temple, um, he had direct descendants that were slaves. And um, he learned those rhythms from his failing members. And it just spread far and wide. And so as a white female, I felt inadequate because tap dancing is dominated by male, African-American males at this time. They are the legends, Gregory Hines, Buster Brown, um, Savion Glover. These are all famous tap dancers um, that people know and love, um, and but they're all African-American men. And there are many, Chloe Arnold is an African-American female, and she is um, one of the most venerated um, tap dancers in the United States right now, maybe even over the world. And I am very lucky to be able to work with her. And so she gave me this opportunity to work with these kids and again I felt inadequate because as a white female I have to make an impression on all of these students 
and about 90% of them are African American um, or non-white. There's we have a few that are Asian and Hispanic as well. So um, the group is growing and more and more students are joining. Um, but I really just felt mute. I lacked self-confidence. I didn't know, you know, where would this lead? And I felt like my whiteness was really the source of that unrest. Um, and so it's when I was thinking about my epistemology, I realized that my white privilege and my bias will affect my research in a lot of ways. And so I need to work on ways that I can, um, that I can identify those biases and be able to um, be objective in all situations. Um, social justice is really important to me, especially in my classroom and in my research, of course. Um, equity in the classroom is the focus of my research and how we can use arts um, to bring about equity because there are a lot of kids that don't have exposure to the arts. And I think that's really important. We need to find gifts in all people. And sometimes it's an artistic gift. Um, but how could I create an environment where my study participants and I can learn together? How can we grow together? And because as a tap dancer, community is so important and being able to work with each other, have a conversation with each other. And sometimes there aren't even words involved in those conversations. We just put on our shoes and tap dance and it's like a conversation. Um, and then finally, how does my whiteness affect my study participants' perceptions of me and how I might represent them in my research? So all of these things came from my 30 minutes every day um, improvising. So you'll notice in the video, I'm improvising right here in my house. I do it every day. And um, sometimes I will improvise slow and maybe I'm having a mundane sort of day. And then sometimes it's much quicker or happier sounding. Um, sometimes you can hear that I have anger um, because I'm hitting the floor very hard. So there's a lot of things that happen um, while I'm improvising and it really has shown me that it is important to understand myself and the way that I see the world and how I can, um, and how I can be equitable um, in my classroom. And then, you know, being a tap dancer and in this environment really helped me to recognize um, my epistemology and the personal stance that I take in my research. And I hope that you enjoy my tap dance and I hope that you can see um, the different aspects of the improvisation that helped me get through all of these questions. Thank you so much. As I begin to improvise, I work through the rhythms that are in my head. I work through the stress that's in my mind and in my body. And I try to decide what is the goal. And then I allow it to melt away. And as I consider my bias, 
as a researcher, I realize that when I'm improvising, I'm not thinking about how my work affects others. But that is a conscious decision. I need to think about how my work will affect others. How will my participants feel? How will they be affected? And what can I do to make them understand my research and my goals? How can I represent them in a way that is fair, that is equitable, and that brings to light the answers to the questions that I have asked.
So I start to have to break my own prejudices. In the same time, I start to open my eyes for new things, for new how people behave and how people interact. And I, I start to learn with them and I remember during the first months I started to follow those groups, they didn't trust me because they always think that the research, they always come here to get the information, but they just go there and they just, they just get the information leave. But I was so like, I was hungry for their knowledge. And I remember I was going in every, I was going every Saturday following them for one year, following them, following them. And they taught me through ethnography that everything in popular culture has a meaning. And you need to respect this. So they remember, for example, when you see, for example, a necklace like this. It's not just yellow and a necklace, yellow and green. But there is a meaning behind that, behind the color, behind the material that they are using. And it's all connected to their ancestors. And, and I start to fall in love also with the drums. I don't know. But the drums with me, I don't know, but the drums just talk to me so much. And they all, they all teach me that the drum is not, you're not just playing the drum, but when you play the drums, you are talking about the ancestors, you are talking about their past lives for the fight when they were slaves. In the same time, I was thinking, who I am to judge them? because they are not fitting those boxes created by Western views. So I just, I found myself, I found myself through ethnographic research. And also today I'm in the United States and I want everybody to understand that when you are studying a group or a community, you are not only studying them. You need to know, you need to, to start to see your research with their eyes. This is gonna take a while. And, but that's how ethnography is so important for me because change who I am and how I see the world. And today when I listen to those music, those songs, for me I need to remember that I need to respect. And I also learned that everything has a meaning. Everything has a meaning. The drums, the colors, the colors, everything has a meaning in popular culture. And as a qualitative researcher, you need to be open to understand that. And you need to open yourself to break your prejudices. Because I think, in my opinion, you have a long, you have a very, you are talking about this community. So you have a responsibility as a researcher. You need to be also concerned about your words and how you write and how you talk about them. Because I'm not talking only about them, but you're talking about their ancestors, about their history. So I want to show you a little bit. This is Afro-Brazilian music. For a long time in my life, I couldn't listen to this. Because it's full of prejudice, full people, they look at this. But I found myself through the drums, through the Afro-Brazilian culture. And when I'm dancing, when I'm dancing, or when I am playing with the, for example, the blue, it's not only a simple dance, but it's the history.
wear like uh, shoes with like made with coconut. And that's how they dance when they were slaves. And everything there is a meaning there. And that's how they come to dance. <laughs> some great explanations about how your arts brought you closer to who you are as a qualitative researcher and what you consider important and that's your epistemology or your positionality but I'd like to ask you to look back now and think and uh, use your own words and just try to describe uh, what this experience has meant to you how about Alyssa will go first Sure. Um, really thinking back to what brought me to tap dancing as well as my research, um, it made me connect to lots of different people, different places that I really hadn't thought to make those connections. And because tap dancing comes from um, African slavery here in the United States, um, and I am, I feel as a tap dancer always grappling with the fact that I am a white person training and teaching with a mostly African American staff and students. And so I'm constantly questioning myself, my bias. And so this really brought to light a lot of those internal struggles that I had been having that were pushing me to, um, question myself as a tap dancer, as an artist, as well as a researcher. And so um, this experience really just opened my eyes and made me um, realize that all of those struggles and all of the things that I feel and the passion that I have for tap dancing, as well as research, um, can really be fused together as one. Thank you. Um, okay, next, Michelle. Michelle. Um, for me, 
when I was in Brazil, like when I was doing this research 13, 14 years ago, I never thought to connect with what I am doing now. And when you are, when I did my master's, we never talk about arts and research. And I remember talking to some of my friends in the sociology department about how I can conduct art, uh, research through arts and how I can, um, and how arts, how, how are arts shape my life. And when I went to my arts based uh, research class, I was just like, wow, I was like, but I also never thought about how my positionality and how in Brazil I was a person, I was, uh, I was studying journalism, communications, and I was doing this, and I was studying those groups. But when I came to the United States, I started to have a different, um, my positionality in the United States is different as an immigrant, as a woman of color, it's all so different. So all these make connections at the same time I'm studying immigration and everything. So everything makes a connection, like to remember that how through arts or through understanding other, the other's culture and how my, my past experience can shape my research now and mm -hmm. how I conduct my research True. and even more now as a positionality of a minority in this country so so in this experience in the past if I didn't have this experience in the past I would not be doing what I'm doing now and I make me more conscious about the responsibility I have about in the ethics doing research and but at the same time, to deconstruct this idea of the academia or the research need to fit this box. No, you can use arts. You can you can you can listen to stories of children or stories of mothers or stories of through arts, and you have you can have an amazing data and analyze those data. But I'm just doing this now because also of my past experience, but also what I learned in the class now with Dr. Richards in doing my research so so that's yes thank you very much michelle and chen okay um i have a similar experience as michelle when i was in china we normally separate arts with other other things we have their arts is like a different thing i never thought i one day in my life i was using arts <laughs> as a research method in my life and uh, after doing the art-based research classes and i I realized how the uh, music, like the traditional Chinese music I played for so many years, finally influenced my uh, my view of the world. If in China, we're not like openly express ourselves, but here I've like battled for so many years because of uh, the Western culture is totally different. So now, um, after studying this and uh, listening to a lot of uh, great students' stories about their art experience, I realized the music I have with the Chinese culture and the music I experience in Western culture can get into a balance. There's a point there, and really making me thinking about myself as a researcher studying, like trained in Western culture, and thinking about my uh, culture grow up. Um, I can really combine them together and find something really uh, interesting and really meaningful for uh, in, in my opinion. Thank you very much, Chen. Just beautiful. Thank you.